This is Chapter 10, Module 3, Types of Muscle Contractions and Types of Muscle Fibers. The learning objectives of this module are 1. Distinguish between the different types of muscle contractions, isometric and isotonic, including concentric and eccentric, and 2. Relate types of muscle fibers to muscular performance. When sarcomeres shorten in a contraction, they shorten the muscle fiber. This shortening exerts tension on the connective tissue fibers attached to the muscle fiber. The tension produced by an individual muscle can vary. The amount of tension produced by the muscle as a whole is the sum of the tensions generated by individual fibers since they are all pulling together. For this reason, the amount of tension produced by a skeletal muscle can be controlled by the number of muscle fibers it stimulates. A typical skeletal muscle contains thousands of muscle fibers. Some motor neurons control a few muscle fibers, but most control hundreds of them. All the muscle fibers controlled by a single motor neuron constitute a motor unit. The size of a motor unit is an indication of how fine the control of the movement can be. In the muscles of the eye, where precise control is extremely important, a motor neuron may control four to six muscle fibers. We have much less precise control over our leg muscles where a single motor neuron may control a thousand to two thousand muscle fibers. In any skeletal muscle, some motor units are always active even when the entire muscle is not contracting. Their contractions do not produce enough tension to cause movement, but they do tense and firm the muscle. This resting tension in a skeletal muscle is called muscle tone. A muscle with little muscle tone appears limp and flaccid whereas one with moderate muscle tone is firm and solid. Resting muscle tone stabilizes the positions of bones and joints. For example, in order to maintain body position, there must be enough motor units stimulated to produce enough tension to do so. We classify muscle contractions as isotonic or isometric. Isotonic contraction is where the tension rises and the skeletal muscle's length changes. Lifting an object off the desk Walking and running involve isotonic contractions. Two types of isotonic contractions exist, concentric and eccentric. In a concentric contraction, the muscle tension exceeds the load and the muscle shortens. In an eccentric contraction, the peak tension developed is less than the load and the muscle elongates due to the contraction of another muscle or the pull of gravity. Think of a tug-of-war team trying to stop a moving car. Although everyone pulls as hard as they can, the rope slips through their fingers. During physical training, people commonly perform cycles of concentric and eccentric contractions, as when you do bicep curls by holding a weight in your hand and slowly flex and extend your elbow. During flexion, your biceps involve concentric contractions. During extension, your biceps are still actively contracting, but now involve eccentric contraction. In an isometric contraction, the muscle as a whole does not change length, and the tension produced never exceeds the load. Examples of isometric contractions include carrying a bag of groceries and holding our heads up. When you perform an isometric contraction, the contracting muscle bulges, but not as much as it does during an isotonic contraction. After a contraction, a muscle fiber must return to its original length. However, there are no active mechanisms for muscle fibers to elongate. Therefore, the muscle fiber returns to its original length through a combination of elastic forces, opposing muscle contractions, and gravity. The tendons and the cell fiber will gradually return the muscle fiber to its original resting length because of its elasticity. The contraction of opposing muscles can return a muscle to its resting length more quickly than the elastic factors can. For example, when the biceps brachii muscle contracts, the triceps brachii muscle extends the elbow and stretches the muscle fibers of the biceps brachii muscle to their original length. And gravity may assist opposing muscle groups in quickly returning a muscle to its resting length after a contraction. For example, when the biceps brachii muscle contracts, the elbow is bent with the forearm elevated. When the muscle relaxes, gravity will pull the forearm down and stretch the muscle. The demand for ATP in a contracting muscle fiber is so high that it would be impossible to have all the necessary energy available as ATP before the contraction begins. Instead, a resting muscle fiber contains only enough ATP to sustain a contraction until additional ATP can be generated. Throughout the rest of the contraction, the muscle fiber will generate ATP at roughly the same rate as it is used. 
Muscle performance capabilities depend on muscle fiber type and physical condition. A muscle's performance involves force, which is the maximum amount of tension produced by a particular muscle, and endurance, which is the amount of time during which the individual can perform a particular activity. Several factors determine the performance capabilities of any skeletal muscle. The type, distribution, and size of muscle fibers in the muscle, as well as physical conditioning and training. The human body has three major types of skeletal muscle fibers. Fast fibers, slow fibers, and intermediate fibers. Most of the skeletal muscle fibers in the body are called fast fibers because they can reach peak twitch tension very quickly. Fast fibers are large in diameter and contain densely packed myofibrils, large reserves of glycogen, and few mitochondria. Muscles dominated by fast fibers produce powerful contractions, but the fibers fatigue rapidly because their contractions use ATP in massive amounts. With so few mitochondria, they are unable to generate ATP to support prolonged activity. Slow fibers have only about half the diameter of fast fibers and take three times as long to reach peak tension after stimulation. They are able to continue contracting longer than a fast fiber because of the extensive capillary network that supplies oxygen to support the activity of the mitochondria. Slow fibers also contain the red pigment myoglobin, which is similar to hemoglobin. Myoglobin helps to deliver oxygen molecules. Skeletal muscles dominated by slow fibers are dark red because slow fibers have both an extensive capillary supply and a high concentration of myoglobin. Intermediate fibers most closely resemble fast fibers for they contain little myoglobin and are relatively pale. They do have an intermediate capillary network and mitochondrial supply around them and are more resistant to fatigue than are fast fibers. Muscles dominated by fast fibers appear pale and are often called white muscles or white meat. Chicken breasts contain white meat because chickens use their wings only for brief intervals as when fleeing a predator. Muscles dominated by slow fibers are known as red muscles or red meat. Chickens walk around all day so their legs contain dark meat which contain the capillaries and myoglobin. Most human muscles contain a mixture of fiber types and so appear pink. Many back and calf muscles are dominated by slow fibers and these muscles contract almost continuously to help us remain upright. Our genes determine the percentage of fast versus slow fibers in each muscle. Athletic training can also increase the ratio of intermediate fibers to fast fibers. As a result of repeated extensive stimulation, muscle fibers develop more mitochondria, a higher concentration of glycolytic enzymes, which are enzymes that break down glycogen into glucose, and larger glycogen reserves. The effect of this stimulation is hypertrophy, or an enlargement of the stimulated muscle. The number of muscle fibers does not change significantly, but the muscle as a whole enlarges because each muscle fiber increases in diameter. A skeletal muscle that is not regularly stimulated by a motor neuron loses muscle tone and mass. The muscle becomes flaccid and the muscle fibers become smaller and weaker. This reduction in muscle size, tone, and power is called atrophy. Individuals paralyzed by spinal cord injuries or other damage to the nervous system gradually lose muscle tone and size in the areas affected. Muscle atrophy is reversible at first, but dying muscle fibers are not replaced. That is why physical therapy is crucial for people who are temporarily unable to move normally. Direct electrical stimulation by an external device can substitute for nerve stimulation and prevent or reduce muscle atrophy. This ends Chapter 10, Module 3, Types of Muscle Contractions and Types of Muscle Fibers.